Hello, we're bringing you an extra episode of Newscast to get you ready for tonight's big TV event of the general election campaign. The first head-to-head -head between the two men who could plausibly be Prime Minister at the end of this, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. They're going to be on ITV, it's going to be in the northwest of England, and it will be quite a clash. And there'll be loads of cliches because actually, even though TV debates are quite a new thing in this country that we've only had since 2010, they do have quite a format. So we will dig into what's going to be going on, what the challenges facing the two candidates are, and yes, what cliches you can expect to see. The good thing is, though, about this episode, it's not just going to be kind of blow by blow politics. We are going to give you the tools to be able to watch this debate like a pro. All of that coming up on this episode of Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's Adam in the studio and joining me from Westminster is Henry Zeffman. Hello. Hi Adam, great to be with you. Oh, it's so strange hearing your voice on Newscast on a weekday rather than on a Sunday. Sunday lunchtime. I'm a seven-day operative, what can I say? <laughs> Elections suck everyone in. <laughs> yeah. Also, are we allowed to reveal what we're doing on Saturday? No, let's leave that as a tease. Let's leave that. It is work-related. We're not ha we're not going to the pub in East London. <laughs> well, I mean, if invited, I'd happily accept. Uh, what do you think about my news about seeing our fellow famous East London resident, Paul Mescal, on a run? Um, I'm mostly impressed that you went for a run, which is something <laughs> I last did, um, I think, in the 2010s. But um, there you go. Anyway, you've got to make a dash for Salford soon uh, to go and watch the debate. Um, do you want to just give us the kind of the what's the what's the big political picture a few hours before it starts? Well, this is the biggest moment of the campaign so far, isn't it? I mean, debates often don't change the course of general election campaigns, though sometimes they have done. But until the debate happens, there is the possibility that it might alter the course of the general election. I think it's, you know, an hour or so where in a very stage managed environment of a general election campaign, suddenly the two men who might become prime minister on July the 5th are not in control of events anymore. And that, I think, is a really fascinating moment. It puts them on the spot. And also, it's a new way of seeing the two of them interact. Because, of course, we've seen Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer trade blows for two years, right? Prime Minister's questions, statements in the House of Commons. But you don't need me to tell you the House of Commons is quite an artificial environment. Mm. You know, you've got people sitting behind them making that sort of weird noise that's not quite a heckle and not quite a cheer. And you know, you've got six questions and you've got Lindsay Hoyle rather than Julie Etchingham. And obviously it's all quite House of Commons. This is not going to be, and that fascinates me and I think could make for a really interesting night. And, I mean, this sometimes doesn't come across on screen, but actually being there, the atmosphere is electric because you've got loads and loads of journalists there and, and it's not often that all journalists covering politics are in exactly the same place. People are normally a bit more spread out, so that creates some energy. You then got the fact it's just a big TV production, so it's a bit like going to the X Factor final. That adds loads of energy. Then you've got huge entourages from the parties, including advisors, some of whom you never really see in public, but you see wandering the corridors of the of the TV studio. Plus, you get like the members of the cabinet and the shadow cabinet who are there to spin. Plus, there's just yeah that point you made. We don't know what's going to happen. Because so much of the time in politics, we as journalists all kind of really know what's going to happen. It's just watching it unfold. And, and this is a general election campaign where, I mean, I actually think so far it's been much newsier than the first few weeks of general election campaigns I remember. I mean, maybe there's a kind of recency bias hmm. there, but I, I, I think it's been, I think things have happened day to day. But what hasn't happened is any sort of shift in the overall picture. Uh, you know, Rishi Sunak was desperate to spend the first couple of weeks of this campaign trying a way, trying to find a way to narrow the polls, to find a way to change the political environment that he faced. And as far as we can tell, he hasn't. If anything, the polls have nudged slightly towards the Labour Party. So that adds an extra kind of um, edge mm. to tonight because... It's getting pretty late for Rishi Sunak. I know the general election campaign has several weeks left to run, but obviously people start getting postal votes before then. But also, you know, it's rare that a politician can flip a general election campaign on its head in one moment. So if he's going to find a way to start turning this around, he really does need to make that start tonight. 
And likewise, that means, you know, it, it's quite high stakes for Keir Starmer because he really has everything to lose here and just needs to find a way, as well as prosecuting the case he'll want to prosecute against Rishi Sunak and 14 years of Conservative governments, find a way to kind of hang tight and, and keep his lead going. Also, it's interesting just seeing the the policies that Labour and the Tories are putting on the airwaves today ahead of it to kind of frame it. And it's cl it's classic, isn't it? So you've got the Tories saying, let's have a cap on the number of work and family visas that, the, that we issue if we're in the government in the next parliament. And you've got Labour saying, let's set up GB Energy, which, OK, you won't be able to get an energy bill from GB Energy, but it will contribute, they say, to, to energy security and, and keeping energy bills down. They've gone for kind of core messages to kind of start the process off. And I think it also tells you which uh, parts of each of their support they think are soft. So for the Conservatives, and this has been clear throughout the first couple of weeks of the campaign, hasn't it? The Conservatives are anxious, and they'll be especially anxious after yesterday's news, that they might be losing votes as well as the loads of votes that they're losing to, to Labour, they might be losing votes to the right. And um, they are clearly pursuing a strategy where they want to shore up that flank of their voter coalition. And talking about, well, more than talking about immigration, this would be quite a significant policy if, it, if they win the election and it's introduced. An actual legal cap voted on by Parliament annually, you know, that, that would be a big move. Of course, the political risk for the Conservatives, and we say this on so many issues, but it doesn't make it any less true, is that they are running on a record a 14-year record. And if you are a voter who is eager to see immigration reduced, the Conservatives have a 14-year record which is not going to massively appeal to you. And so you can see why they might question why they should believe Rishi Sunak and James Cleverley, the Home Secretary, who's been fronting this announcement this time. Equally, though, what I found intriguing about Labour's change message, and it is literally just the word change, is that, OK, that might appeal to people who want a change of government and a change of how the country works. But when you're talking about change, we all then start going, oh, change to what? And sometimes the details are a bit lacking. And then you go, change from what? Which then means we start asking questions about, oh, Keir Starmer, you supported Jeremy Corbyn to be prime minister twice. And some of the, the Labour front bench now actually voted against renewing the nuclear deterrent. So the, the, the change to and the change from become just as important as the idea of changing. Totally. I mean, on the change from point, you will hear Rishi Sunak in this debate. I, I would be, I mean, I would be stunned if he doesn't twice, three times, four times get in there that Keir Starmer served in, forgive me, get in there that Keir Starmer served in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet, was his shadow Brexit secretary, tried to make him prime minister twice. Because, of course, that is a big um, hitch for a Labour leader who has pursued a, a, an energetic policy of decorbinification. I mean, that has been one of the um, key planks of his Labour leadership over the past four years. And uh, it's an ongoing process, as we've seen with some of the rows over Labour selections over the past week or so. So uh, you will hear Rishi Sunak make that point and make that point for two reasons. I think the Conservatives think it's a way of reminding people about the Labour Party that they rejected in 2019 but also a way of hitting a broader argument that they want to make about Keir Starmer, which is that he's a bit shifty. And that gets into questions about the many pledges he made during his 2019, uh, sorry, 2020 Labour leadership election, which um, he has unequivocally abandoned. Good to preview it with you, Henry. Um, safe travels and see you soon. See you soon. Well, let's pick up on some of those themes with some political professionals. Not that Henry's not a professional, but I mean, people on the other side. We're joined in the studio by political strategist and former advisor to Boris Johnson, Joe Tanner. Hello, Joe. Hello. And happy birthday. Thank you. And thank you for bringing me a cake. Well, you know, it's, I thought it seemed appropriate. In the best Brexit cast just, traditions. Just pre the debate, just to get the excitement Exactly, going. get the sugar levels up. It's going to be a long day. And also former Labour advisor, Tom Hamilton. Hi, Tom. Hello. So, Tom, you advised Ed Miliband in 2015. Yeah, I was part of the debate prep team then. Then, and I pretended to be David Cameron and then later on pretended to be Nigel Farage. Oh, yeah, I'm always intrigued about the advisors who have to do... How do you do that? Well, you... Um, I've been doing David Cameron for quite a long time because I used to do David Cameron for PMQs um, while I was leader. So I had a pretty good sense of what he was likely to say and 
really importantly, actually, what you need to know what their policies are and the sort of language they use to talk about their policies. And um, it's not that hard to know what that is because mm. they're doing it all the time in the public. So it's not really, it's not that hard a job um, unless you want to do an impression or anything like that. And I, Did you? I, I, I was never an impressionist. No. Um, well, I suppose you want to get the speech patterns. You, a bit, yeah. And, the, and you want to get the sort of attacks that he's likely to give. So, you, you know, one of the things about that sort of job is that you have a licence to be rude to the leader's face in a way that a lot of other people, even in the Cheddar Cabinet, Mm. aren't and i guess the the the, the, the biggest lesson of how good i was at that is I, I don't do that anymore um joe is is there a different strategy for each event and for each leader or actually is there just like a sort of some rules of thumb for everyone no there, there are definitely the formats make a big difference because when it's a one-on-one -on -one, you've got essentially one line of attack to be aware of um, so you're sort of you're think you're trying to anticipate what what's the sort of what's the crux of the question going to be, and therefore do I address it or do I do what politicians often do, which is sort of give an answer anyway, but says what I want to say without answering it. Um, but then you're looking at what that what that sort of left field, particularly if you're Rishi, what is it that's going to come in as the attack, and also what is the attack I'm going to put out there. So when you've got multiple leaders, it's a different strategy because you're looking at, you know that if you're the sitting PM, you're the one that gets all the incoming fire yeah. and you've got to decide which ones you want to take out or do you just kind of ignore them all, which has happened before in those debates where you just focus on your main rival. And also it's a bit of a four-dimensional chess game when it comes to audiences because you've got, well, you've got the person who's opposite you at the other podium. You've got the the moderator, in this case, Julie Etchingham tonight, who's like amazing, amazing at these things. Then you've got the studio audience, who in some years have been quite rowdy and it's got a bit pantomime -y. And then you've got the audience watching at home. And of course, they're subdivided into lots of different types of voters. And you've got the media watching the whole oh, yeah, spectacle Us, because, yeah. because the media will quite quickly make some sort of observations or, or almost give a sort of scorecard on it. And that will impact on how tomorrow's papers look. So you've actually got that dimension as well, because if, if people think, you know, if there's a if they see a sort of chink of a problem or they see a slight flicker of an eye or a bit of panic, that's where it's like, right, we smell blood and then you go. But that means for the for the principles, as we as we sometimes yeah. call them, the cogs must be whirring at a million miles an hour. Yeah. And a lot of it is a lot of it is prepped, actually. And the reason they put so much effort into it is so that they know how these things are going to go. So they do game it out. And one of the things we, that we already knew in 2015 when there were those multi-party debates with seven seven leaders in one debate and five leaders in another was we already knew that it was particularly hard for Labour because, um, and I'm not trying to make excuses, it's not it's not why Labour lost that election, but, um, you know, the SNP could just attack Labour um, and call for Scottish independence, which was completely reasonable, that's their position. Mm -hmm. Plaid Cymru could attack Labour as their main opponent in Wales. The more time Ed spent talking about the SNP or Plaid Cymru, the less time he was spending talking about David Cameron and the more he was validating that big conservative argument at the time, which was, look at all these guys, it's going to be a coalition of chaos if they get in um, and they're all bickering amongst themselves. So Ed was trying to take the fight to David Cameron, but he's trying to, but he's being picked off from different angles by the smaller parties who didn't really care about the Tories in the same way. So something that might have just looked like the debate unfolding naturally and wasn't necessarily like a big headline gotcha moment ended up being really consequential. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we, and we we knew we knew what was coming. Um, so much of it was scripted. And actually, uh, you might remember Ed left some of his debate notes on the on the lectern after one of oh, the debates. And it got I'm some, a happy warrior. Got, got in the sun. Yeah, that was um, that was quite annoying. What was that phrase about? So um, that was um, he had a sheet of reminders about you know particular lines that he that he wanted to use, and that was more. Um, that was more about how uh, the, the general sort of tone to approach in the debate. Don't get too angry. Um, be relatively lighthearted about it. And I, you know, it, it's not it's not bad advice. But you shouldn't leave your notes on the yeah. Don't leave your <laughs> post-it notes hanging around afterwards. <laughs> Joe, what sort of person, what sort of politician is best suited to these debates? Because I'm thinking, like, you would have thought David Cameron, Mr. Smoothie, very unruffled, very good at delivering a line in quite a natural way. You think he would be the ideal candidate for these, but actually he always struggled. And that's the that's the thing. I think that's where Nick Clegg did so well because Nick Clegg sort of was delivering lines but was quite relaxed. And so what he did was made David Cameron look more rehearsed and much more stilted, maybe a little bit too polished. Mm. And so you sort of, in a sense, depending on the environment, that's how you can you can show up flaws by sort of holding a mirror to them because of the way that others behave. So this one in particular, 
I think what's going to be challenging is that we know that Rishi Sunak's had a, a sort of habit with the media of getting quite ruffled, getting a little bit tetchy, and, and you've and got did to that avoid with Liz that. And during one of their leadership And that's debates. part of the problem. We've seen, you know, I sort of look back to when I first started doing this stuff. We didn't have social media to be able to look at endless clips and look at those sort of behavioural traits in a way that the team that are prepping for tonight are able to do. So... There are lots of little, you know, oh, can we get in by doing this? Can we sort of throw this allegation out? Because we know that always winds him up. So that both parties are going to look at where they think there's a weakness. Tom, what do you think Keir Starmer's weak spot might be presentationally? Oh, that's a good that's a good question. I think um I think there may be there may be elements where um he will he will want to attack um Rishi Sunak on a whole range of things. And I think he'll he will he, he, it's quite important that he sticks to his his lines. The most important thing that Labour wants to get out of this debate is it's partly to to introduce Keir Starmer to people who haven't necessarily been watching him that closely. One of the really interesting things about one of the reasons Dick Clegg did so well in 2010 actually um, was. Um, he just wasn't anything like as well known as the as the other leaders, and so he's the fresh faced young Nobody, man, and people yeah. go, oh, that 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 guy saying that all these other parties have messed it up, and maybe Which I shouldn't translate in. into loads did, of seats, didn't but translate it got into loads, translated seats, into loads of great media coverage. He, he won the debate, and the polls mo br moved briefly. I think. Um, Starmer, he's been leader for quite a long time now. One of the people, one of the things that people say about him is they they still don't know what what Labour wants to do and what, mm. uh, what Keir Starmer stands for. One of the big things that the Tories say about Labour is that they haven't got a plan. I think the main thing that he'll want to get out is to say, look, we have got a plan, here's what it is. And to be fair to Labour, they spent quite a long time laying it out. So there's a risk for Sunak, I think, that he sort of, that he walks into a punch there and says, they've told you nothing. And um, and, and Starmer goes, well, let me tell you all the things that I, that, that, that I want to do. OK, then, how do you craft an answer for the leaders to give? Because as you said, it's all pre-scripted and planned that somebody in the audience says, what are you going to do about, I don't know, NHS waiting times or making sure my kids can afford to buy a home? What's the kind of, what's the structure of the answer that means you can do a bit of biography, yeah. attack the, the other guy and also lay out your policy, but not giving like a 12 minute lecture? So um, I've not, I've not been involved in this, so I'm making this up, but if On the spot. But, Ke but Keir Starmer getting that, getting that, that question would be, first of all, I understand the problems that you and your family have gone through in the NHS because millions of people around the country are facing that as well. I care about the NHS because my mum was a nurse in the NHS. It's really important to me. My, I, th I, think his, um, I think his wife works for the NHS as well. So he's got family connections. The NHS is in trouble. Here are some facts about the state of the NHS now and the fact that waiting lists have been going up. Ambulance is queuing outside hospitals. Not enough doctors and nurses. The label will have its exact lines about that. Here's what we're going to do to change it. We've got policies to get um, to, to bring waiting lists down by having more appointments at evenings and weekends. Now, I just I just made that up. Yeah. But you can fill two minutes with that. I think all of those things are beats that he would want to hit, and um, and it, and it covers a bit of personal, a bit of attack, a bit of plan. And then you get into the back and forth with Rishi Sunak later. That's somebody who's done a lot of debate prep. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, give us something else that's going on behind the scenes that kind of helps these guys, and it's usually guys, and it definitely will be two guys tonight, um, get get through this. So they'll be they'll be throwing out, well, they'll be the usual sort of, they've all got to eat properly. They, You know, I'm sure Rishi will have been for a run or something. Uh, they'll, have, <laughs> they'll, have, yeah, they'll have probably tried to, well, they've been very careful about the outfits because we know there's a lot of scrutiny about what they're wearing. Um, they will have done the the sort of what do the notes look like that they actually need. So they'll have gone through the key message stuff. Keir's going to be going through his pledges. It will be kind of how do I get those down? Rishi, Rishi, I'm sure, has just rehearsed how to say the word plan several times over in lots of different ways. Uh, they probably, I'd have thought with Rishi, if, if he's got the team he should have around him doing the prep, they should have literally poked him so hard that, you know, to the point where he really wants to swear at all of them, but, you know, won't. Mm. Um, and and I think with Kia, it will be about keeping him sort of, I can almost sort of picture a sort of rocky sort of setup where they're sort of trying to get Kia to be quite flexible, loose. They've both got to loosen up these guys. Mm. They're both very, very structured and they're, you know, quite frankly, at times, relatively uninspiring in terms of their ability to just kind of talk but instead, it's very sort of very controlled. They both need to loosen up if they're going to have any connection with the public. And that's probably not easy for either of them. 
Um, I know every time you come on newscast, we get a Boris Johnson horror story. I don't want to play that cliche as well, but but it comes back to my but point. There's so many of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, multiple podcasts. You keep us in business for years. Um, but it's it's back to my point about how the character of the person doesn't always play out in the way you think it would, because you think Boris Johnson. A person who rips up the rules, who's very entertaining, uh, who's prepared to be quite aggressive, but can do it in a way that looks quite funny. Actually, even he didn't have that many great debate moments either. He had he had a really mixed run. I mean, the first one we did was back in 2008 for the mayoralty. And we hadn't had this format in the UK before. So we were actually planning for something we didn't even really understand. It was really difficult. Um, And. What happened, as if you look at sort of Boris's career, what gradually happened was it went from kind of you're the clown and you can't be taken seriously to towards the latter part of, of his political career, it became all the things that he was bad or about or had to sort of defend. And what actually happened at one point, I think, during the debates with him was that it became a bit of a pylon. And I think some people felt a bit sorry for him, which was probably the last thing anyone expected sort of the reaction to Boris to be. But it just, he sort of looked like it was like a big gang of people, just kind of one Mm -hmm. after the other, like sort of playground bullies. Um, But his ability to, one thing he did have was he just had a sort of vault of clever responses. I think having done all those sort of after dinner speeches and sort of off the cuff remarks that he was quite good at, he had sort of a stock of those that even if you were rehearsing him, you'd be like, where did that one come from? I've not heard that one before, you know, and he'd just come out with something. So I think the interactions with the public and I suppose all those interactions with sort of business leaders and, you know, just just his career to date meant that he had he had a sort of a he just had a bank of stuff he could go back to. Well, I'm going to bring up the Brexit debate again, which I brought up with Henry Zeffman a minute ago. And I remember Independence Day 2 was coming out and I saw an advert for it on a bus on the way to the debate at Wembley. And I was like, bet Boris Johnson will use that. <laughs> and he did. And that was his ability to connect with people. that You could almost... Part of working with Boris was that you would meet people who didn't like him or didn't think they would like him or didn't want to like him because of his politics... And then we'd meet him and go, oh, he was quite a good bloke. Oh, he was funny. Oh, he wasn't what I expected. And that was, I think, where even the difficult debates, he still sort of left people often thinking, oh, yeah, that was quite entertaining, which Mm. maybe wasn't always the plan, but it perhaps took away from sometimes some of the answers. What about just practical things, Tom? And I'm thinking, like, making sure your leader doesn't um, trip off the stage, as Ed Miliband did when he was on the big question time leaders thing right at the end of the campaign. Well, yeah, I mean, that, 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 was the, that was the last thing. And I, what I'll say in my defence is that I did specifically say don't trip off the stage before he, <laughs> before he went on, but that shows what a, what, what a, how, how, I wanted how, how clearly the, my advice was taken. I just thought his problem there was that he'd let down his guard and he thought, job done. And actually, yeah, no, that, job's not done till you're back in the It's almost room. like walking off with a mic, though, isn't it? Isn't that, I think that's, I think that's prob- probably right, and um, I mean, it was one of those, you know, anyone can anyone can trip up, um, but it got clipped, and and it, and it fed into a narrative that people um, people wanted to push, particularly people who were opposed to him, and so you know, um, it but it never helped to to mm. trip up like that. But yeah, that was that ended up being relatively uh, memorable. But Theresa May's closing line in 2017, when she was in a similar format, because I think that was in a sort of question time audience format, her last line of the campaign basically was, I'm afraid there's no magic money tree to give you what you want. And she said that to a nurse who was asking for a pay rise. Mm. So actually her closing image, closing soundbite wasn't great either. No, and and that's where, you know, I think to have a little bit of sympathy for these folks that do these they are completely foreign environments to what they're used to. So they're used to, if they were coming in to do, to do this, they would have seen how it looks. They'd know. Each fo- each debate mm-hmm. format changes. Mm. The, the set changes. So, you know, do you know where the step is, etc. But if they do standard interviews, they know roughly where they're headed and what it looks like. So I think the thing with that is they sort of lose a sense of how long they're even in the studio. They have a sense, they they lose sense of time. You know, the adrenaline's rushing. They can't remember what they said 10 minutes ago. Um, and I think on that point, you know, Teresa was obviously being honest, but it it, it didn't look mm-hmm. great. And that's the reality is you, you can't always perhaps say what you really want to say. And, and you've got to think about the framing because it is, you're essentially being pitted against somebody who's in a very different role yeah. and, and it, it therefore landed badly. The other thing about 2017, of course, was that, I mean, Theresa May did the, uh, did the question time, which were a series of one-on-ones, mm. but she didn't do 
the the, the main TV debate. She no. pulled out of it. Um, and Corbyn I, turned up at the last minute. Cor- yeah, yeah and, and and I guess that was partly a look. I'm a, I'm ahead in the polls. This is this, this there's no win for me in this. I might as well not bother. But not turning up just made her look incredibly weak. and was probably a really bad move. So even if the best you can hope to get out of these debates, and I think it normally is the best you can hope to get out of these debates, is a score draw. Um, you, you just got to go and get it um, because otherwise you, you you lose it. What I always think about at these moments, though, is that even if somebody is doing badly in the polls or they've made loads of gaffes, you realise to get to that level in politics, you've got to have something. And the thing that I always think in these debates is if that was me up there, I would be sweating buckets, no matter how much makeup I've got on. No one is ever sweating buckets on there because so they're, cause, cause they've, they've made it to the top. Of the game, yeah, and and, and because the th- they've got something. One of the things about politicians that that people sort of forget is that any of them who are any good um, have spent years giving short mm. but decent answers to difficult questions. And in these debates, they're usually not even that difficult questions. They're what are you going to do about the NHS? What are you going to do about immigration? What are you going to do about the economy? They, they might be difficult questions, but they're not questions that these people haven't thought about and got an answer to. So this is the first chance for the public to hear some of these, frankly, quite scripted answers, which, we, which we've made to sound as unscripted as possible, but in the end, they're things that have been prepped. But they're not the first time that the politicians have, have done them. And... Um, it is a skill, but it's also something that people hone over years and years. And to get to the point of being the leader of a party, you know, no one starts off as the leader of a party. So it doesn't happen it by pa- accident. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, what cliches are almost guaranteed to be trotted out tonight? Um, I think we'll have the standard attacks about what is it, Sir Softy? I think they've been using on Keir and, <laughs> the, like and an the sort cream. of yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I think it might sort of evoke a bit of a you know, oh, bit of sort of people thinking nice thoughts about the seaside, I'm not sure. Um, but I think there'll be there'll be the attacks on Keir's background, who he's defended, Corbyn's support, all of that standard stuff. I think there'll be the attacks on Rishi, his wealth, and, you know, what does he really stand for? Um, I think the bit that I'd love it if... I think it, it's time that Rishi actually surprised everybody, and I think he should address the Liz Truss era he still hasn't drawn a line under that and sort of said you know I didn't want her to be leader either I was standing against her and actually you know I've been unpicking her mess since I got in and I think if he'd sort of put a bit of clear water between him and her I think it would be really helpful I'm not convinced they will because I think they should have done it by now if they were going to do it but Mm. that would be the kind of thing I think he could use the opportunity for yeah I mean I I think that's I think that's right and that would be quite a smart thing to do and they've done a bit of that already I mean we've heard him say a few times that you know you shouldn't reduce the last 14 years to just 49 days it's like well you know people's mortgages um are what they are because of the bad things that happen you you can almost any government may only have a small number of short bad periods but those are the ones that people remember and it's not unreasonable for, the, for them to vote on on, on that and um, i would expect both leaders to talk a bit about background i expect to hear about uh, rishi sinak's parents and um you know doing the books on the in the mm. back room of the pharmacy when he was a kid i expect to hear about keir starmer's pebble dashed house and his father being a tool maker and his mother working in the nhs or all, all, all this stuff um, and some of that feels like a cliche and some of that is stuff that all of us as sort of political junkies who pay mm. attention to this stuff have heard but to be fair the watching public because you know there will be millions of people watching this this thing tonight who haven't necessarily tuned in and just starting to think about the election and um, they may think they know how they're going to vote but they they could be persuaded to to change and um and they're still asking, who is Rishi Sunak really? Who is Keir Starmer really? And a big part of this isn't just to roll out policies, but to tell that story and try and make that human connection, which both of them may be less adept at than some of the politicians that we've seen in the past, but they can both do it and they've, they've got to do it today. Tom, thank you very much. And Joe, I suppose you'll be watching TV rather than going out for a birthday dinner. I'm going to maximise my day and then I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to do that today and then I, I will be sad enough to tune in on my birthday. So this is the second election that's been over my birthday because we had the 2001 when it was put off for foot and mouth. I, um, I ended up having to work on my... I met John Major on my birthday last time. What a treat. But I got to spend We got your John major gram Who arranged that? <laughs> And that's all for this episode of Newscast. We will be back with another one, except it's going to be a late one because we have to watch the debate. Then I have to somehow manage to get Chris Mason, Alex Forsyth and Chief Economics Correspondent Darshini David in the same place at the same time so we can talk about it and then tell you about it. So that will probably be hitting your feeds, 
I reckon before midnight on Tuesday night. But I uh, hope you don't mind staying up late or getting up early. Bye. Newscast from the BBC.